Before we start the show, just wanted to let you know that Garden Fork now has a t-shirt and sweater shop. Very exciting, isn't it? There'll be a link in the show notes here to the show. If you want like a hoodie or a sweater or a t-shirt, that is now a real thing. All right, links to that stuff are in the show notes. Here we go. Hey, how you doing? Welcome to Garden Fork Radio. Is this your first time here? It's what I call eclectic DIY. Somebody recently described it as haphazard, so maybe haphazard DIY, but it's me and my friends talking about what I think, what we hope you think are interesting things as well. It ranges from how to fix stuff, to electric cars, to recycling, to gardening, to cooking, Really kind of, it's like, a, it's like a big world out there and we talk about it. So welcome, this is your first time. If it isn't, you already know what you're here for, right? It's more of Eric. So today I have on the show my friend Serena, who I met last year when I went to the Troy Built headquarters in Cleveland. Had never been to Cleveland before, had a really great time. And we met in the lobby of the hotel, me and the, I guess I'm called an Troy Built ambassador. Anyway, as some of you know, I do some projects with them. But Serena was one of the people that was there. She has a YouTube channel called Thrift Diving and a a company website called thriftdiving.com. And we got to know each other. It was just kind of one of those, just, it just blended like boom done. There wasn't that kind of awkwardness or, you know, it just clicked very nicely. We kind of had similar interests and she has so much energy and I thought, oh, I could learn from Serena. So, and I really have, she's brilliant at creating interesting content, interesting videos and really interesting um, posts on her site. She just has a really nice voice when she's writing and she's brilliant at like going to the thrift store and making something out of nothing. Uh, it can be something in your house or something right across in the thrift store. And she knows a lot about wallpaper, removing it, and also about using spray paint. So Serena and I got together on Skype here, and we're going to talk about how to remove wallpaper and also how to use spray paint. Ready? Let's go. Hey, Serena. Welcome to Garden Fork. Hey, what's up, Eric? It's 16 degrees here, and it's warmer where you are. Yeah, we're at a nice balmy 30 degrees, which is insane because last week it was 75 degrees. I'm like, it's January. Yeah. Oh. Yikes. Yeah. I'm I'm not, you know, I'm, it's not that I love the cold, but if it's supposed to be cold, let's just make sure that it's cold. Like, this is what it's supposed to be. <laughs> so you're down near the, the D.C. area, right? I am. I'm in Silver Spring, Maryland, which is, it's part of what we call the DMV uh, district. Maryland, Northern Virginia. So it's, yeah, we say Washington, D.C., but it's all this area. Mm-hmm. All right. I've driven through there, but I've not spent a lot of time there. But yeah, I know it's warmer than where I am here up in the top of <laughs> Connecticut right now. Yeah, I, 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 I couldn't do that. That's a little too cold for me. So you have um, a really nicely growing YouTube channel. With Thank you. What I think are pretty addictive videos that have a uh, a very approachable quality. It's not mm-hmm. like you're not like the 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 expert contractor from this old house. You're right. Hey, I bought this house, and mm-hmm. you know I'm doing it all myself. And here's what I'm doing. Yep. And I had two specific things I wanted to ask you about. The first was removing wallpaper, and the other one is the right way to use spray paint because you <laughs> seem to be really good at both of those things. <laughs> Well, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that you can do with the camera to make sure that if you have drips with your spray paint, nobody sees them. But yes, we can we can definitely talk about that for sure. Because um, um, I in my previous life as a contractor, I would run into a lot of jobs where we had to take off wallpaper. Mm-hmm. And it's not as easy as they make it sound. And yet your video, it was, I was like, wow, that worked really well. Yeah. Well, I, I kind of find myself being in this position where, you know, every few years or so I'm removing wallpaper. Like when we moved in this, so this, our house is a 1973 home. So just to give you an idea, the neighborhood is, it's an older neighborhood. Most of the homes here have wallpaper unless the homeowners have removed them, you know, the new people that have moved in, but there's a lot of original owners 
that still live here. So there's a lot of wallpaper. And when we moved in, we literally had wallpaper in, I would say, 95% of the home. Every room was just covered in wallpaper. Now, thankfully, it wasn't like the really offending wallpaper where you walk in, it's like, you know, big green flowers. And no, I mean, it was livable for a short period of time, but it had to come down. And I remember when we were doing our research on removing wallpaper, you know, you probably have seen some of these products. Like it's, there's this little product called a tie. I think it's called a tiger. It just scores. You're supposed to do it in circles or like, you know, wax on, wax off type circles all over the wallpaper. And and then you're supposed to spray it with water and it's supposed to magically, well, it didn't, it didn't happen. Like we tried that and it was just torturous. So I had discovered uh, a wallpaper steamer and it worked brilliantly. I mean, it came off pretty good. There was some, you know, I call them brown paper bag areas, you know, when you remove wallpaper and you see the, the, the paper of the drywall has been removed. And so now you've got the paper just there exposed. Oh, right, and, right. Yeah. And so, but, but the thing is, is that not only do you remove the wallpaper, but then you still have all the glue. And if you've ever removed wallpaper, you'll know that that glue is, it's treacherous. I mean, not only are you going over with the steamer to remove well, if you're lucky, one layer of wallpaper. If you're unlucky, it's painted and you've got multiple layers. Yeah, welcome to my <laughs> people world. Do find, yeah, people do find that as well. Um, but, you know, the process that I had discovered that seemed to work for me was putting on that steamer, peeling off that layer, but then once all the wallpaper's off, going back over it with the steamer and then taking maybe like a six-inch knife, um, like a putty knife, and just scraping that stuff off. Of course, you know, making sure you don't gouge your walls. Right. And, you know, now, now one thing that's interesting, though, I will, I will cut to this because some people are saying, well, hey, there's a better way. Some people in the YouTube comments of that video and even another contractor had told me that uh, like wool light, any of those, um, what do you call them? Like the dryer, the, I can't think of the name of it. Like those the washing, magic sponges? No, not the magic sponge, but like the dryer, um, Dryer the sheets? laundry softener, like the laundry softener. The oh, liquid. yeah. Wool light was for like wool clothing, the washing yes. your wool clothing. Yes. And so apparently it's not wool light, but it's any of those brands of like fabric softener. If you spray that, you know, mix it with water, spray that. He said it just peels off. And I'm like, okay, uh-huh. now I need to find another room with wallpaper because we got to test that out. <laughs> I've never heard of that. I had never heard of that either, but he, you know, he said that he said it works and the comments of that video, some people said that works as well. So, you know, for anyone who's listening to this, you know, try that, do, do a little bit of research, Google and find out using fabric softener to remove wallpaper because apparently it, it works now, you know, because I had so much wallpaper, I figured I'm going to go with what I know. I'm going to use a steamer. It's a little $50 steamer that I got from a hardware store. Yeah. And, and that was my process. Apply that steamer, peel off that wallpaper, apply the steamer again and scrape off this glue. And then you want to use, you know, some clear water. I used a little bit of simple green just to help clean that wall and and still clean some of that glue residue, Mm -hmm. because that's really important. If you try to paint over this wall and the glue is not completely um, wiped off, you'll start seeing little little spots on your wall, like a little dark spot and ask me how I know. Yeah. Because, (laughs) because in my bedroom, I got a little lazy with that, that wallpaper removal. And, and sure enough, I ended up having to go over it several coats just to try to cover it up. So don't skip on removing the glue and all of that. But the thing that people didn't realize, um, and that I didn't realize when removing wallpaper is that, you know, when you have those brown paper bag areas, you have to fill those in with joint compound Mm -hmm. and it's called skim coating, right? So it's basically just taking a knife. You can do a six inch, but you know, it's probably better to maybe even have an eight inch and you're just skimming that stuff over those low spots where those paper bag areas are. And surprisingly it fills it in like magic. And once that dries, then you want to prime it and then you paint and you should be good to go. Now, if you have multiple layers, I mean, it's going to be more work for someone but I think the process is still the same. And I just, if anybody said, how am I going to remove wallpaper? I would tell you, hands down, you can't go wrong with the steamer. And you don't even have to deal with the chemicals because 
you know, some people don't want to use fabric softener. There's chemicals in there. Right. So definitely the steam, just water. You don't do, Now, the, here's the thing. You just want to make sure that you have something on your floors because all that steam is producing water and you will have puddles all over your, you know, carpet or wood flooring oh, or something. Oh, good point. Yes, definitely, definitely have some towels there and, and be very careful because there are times when, when I've reached up over top and I have, you know, gone to pull some of this, this wallpaper off and I'm pulling the steamer back and some of that steam comes up and can burn your hands. So just be very careful. It is, it, it can be dangerous if it splashes up on you, but it's, it's my foolproof method for removing wallpaper, getting it out of your house and just making your house just look more modern. I mean, nice. but can we just say, though, Eric, that <laughs> I know there are some people who are listening to this and they're like, wallpaper is back in style. And you know what? Yeah. It is. Did you hear that? I know it. <laughs> I have it's some wallpaper back... in my new house, actually, my new old oh, house. Really? Yes. I mean, and, and the thing is, I, I think that wallpaper today, you know, it, it can still be a nightmare to remove, but it is still fashionable. Like people love wallpaper and and I and I I'm not I'm not gonna lie as much as I hate wallpaper I am interested in trying the removable wallpaper so if it's something that I can just put up and then peel down sort of like that old contact paper I'd be willing to try it but as long as it doesn't require me pulling out that steamer again then I would try it (laughs) in small doses so to backtrack a bit before you do the steaming do you have to do um run across that perforator tool that puts little dimples in it and then steam it? No, no, you don't. I, I ditched that thing years ago because I realized it didn't work. So when your wallpaper is just there, um, you haven't sprayed it with anything. You haven't done anything to it. You just put that steamer up there, let it bubble for let's say 20 seconds or so. And then it should fully melt that, that glue so that you can peel it off from the wall. And you'll notice the paper bag, the the paper bag area, that's occurring when you're not giving that glue enough time to loosen up because you're, you're pulling, I mean, it's, it's stuck to the paper. So it's going to pull it off if you're not giving it enough steam. So when you're pulling back and if you realize, oh, it's pulling off all this paper from the drywall, then you have to apply a little bit more steam. But just realize that some paper bag areas is normal. Like you're not going to just remove sheets of wallpaper and there's no skim coating that you'll have to do. Like that has never happened in my house. You will have to do some sort of skim coating. But I mean, the bucket of mud, the joint compound yeah. is maybe $6, maybe a little bit more if you get the bigger, b- bigger bucket. But all of that I cover in my video. And the walk-in closet where I was removing this Yes, a walk-in closet was wallpapered. This walk-in closet that had the wallpaper, it's now painted, although I I don't really like the color. Did you, what do you think of that color that I chose? It's like a steel blue color. What do you think of that? Well, in small doses, it's fine. I mean, it's it's an accent color in a closet, so it's, you know. I know, but you know what? It feels so manly, and I feel like the walk-in closet, I want it to be pretty. Oh, I didn't think of that. I'm a guy. (laughs) But I don't know if I told you that, well, I did tell you that I'm starting a podcast. I've yeah. been recording some episodes, but I'm I'm not launched yet. I wanted to have a place that was small enough to like get really good audio because right now I'm in my basement. I, I have my office in the basement and the audio is still a little echoey. But in this closet, oh my gosh, Eric, it's like a podcaster's dream. So yeah. I'm redesigning this entire closet and I'm going to have a little two foot area that's going to be a desk with enough, you know, space for my tablet and a little chair that I refinished. That's also on my YouTube channel. So that's why I want it to be girly because I plan to spend a little bit of time in my closet. That's why. (laughs) Actually, that is a uh, radio reporting trick. Um, I learned about it from NPR. They have some Mm -hmm. how to they have a whole series on their website about how to re- how to re- do radio reporting and podcasting. Really? And if they mm-hmm. are on location or if they have a freelancer or someone's working late at night, they they find the coat closet in their apartment or whatever. Oh, and that's I where they record it. all the voiceovers. They'll read the <laughs> script on their phone and they're in there with a microphone and all the coats. So 
<laughs> I love it. it. It it really does work because the the audio and I noticed as I was going back through all the footage of, you know, I took before footage, after and all that good stuff. And just listening to the footage of myself doing my little intro in the closet when all the clothes were in there, it sounded so good. I was like, wait a minute. I'm I'm on to something here. Like this this really does work. So it's good to know that it that it works and the professionals do it. Yeah, and it's well, you'd be surprised. I mean, I used to work in that world, so <laughs> there's a lot of duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> so the um, you were talking about skin skim coating, and we use mm-hmm. the term a knife, and it's 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 a very long putty knife, and the more flexible that blade is, I found the easier it is to skim coat. Yes, definitely. Now, now I, I I don't know if I had told you this, but I'm actually in a carpentry program yeah. at my local community college. Did I tell you that? We talked about it the last time you were on. Okay, so which I think is had, fantastic. Oh, it, it's so much fun! It's so much fun. I'm I'm actually starting classes next week, and I'm doing a um, I'm taking another electrical wiring class, which I didn't think that I would love electrical wiring. But it's fascinating. It's not as boring as I thought it was. I love um, wiring. Oh my gosh, it's it's great. I mean, the things the things that you learn how to do um, with wires. I mean, just you know what it is. It's it's like it's like problem solving, right? Like, how do you get these electrons to this particular switch and get it back to a different switch, and then get it back? You know, it's it's just amazing when you think about the steps that you have to take. And this is what we did in class. Like we had a little board and we had switches and we had a little power supply. And so he would draw a little diagram on the board and it would say, okay, you need to, you need one three-way switch here, one four-way switch, and you need to power this light bulb. Now I want you to wire it in this direction and figure out which wires you need. And I'm like, okay. Yeah, it was challenging, but it was fun too. I really enjoyed it. Um, but last semester I took a class on interior repair and remodeling and we, we actually did put up some drywall in these little cubicles that we had built and just using the knives, um, was a lot of fun. I mean, you know, when you're doing drywall, you have to work up to that larger knife, right? So you're starting with a, uh, with a six inch and then you're moving to like an eight or 10 and then you're moving to a 12. And when I had done my, my drywall, I was just using like like a little six inch putty knife. There was no give to it, but you're right. In the past, I've used ones that have give and I seem like, it seems like it's a little easier to use, but I also think that people should, you know, try to, to use the eight inch because you can cover more space. And I think that really helps with when you're skim coating and basically skim coatings when you're putting some of this joint compound on the knife and you're just gliding it over these low spots, all of these paper bag areas or, you know, any nail holes in the wall, things like that, that could, could mess up the finish of your, your paint. And you, when you're, when you're smoothing it over, sometimes I find with a six inch, if you're trying to work a large area, you, you tend to get those little ripples. So if you switch to an eight inch, you, you get a nice clean skim coat, skim coated area. Cause you're generally not going to have, you know, any huge areas, but you might have some, you know, that are two, three inches and the six inch knife is going to make, give you a little bit of problem, could give you some problems. My industry secret is I take the putty knife that I'm going to skim coat with Mm -hmm. and I take it on a bench grinder or a right angle metal grinder and the corners, which have a kind of a sharp right angle at the very edges of them, I round them off. Very smart. Very smart. Because yeah, because then you end up, if you don't do that, you will gouge your drywall and then you're having to go around and Fix all your gouges. That's a that's a good idea. A little secret there. You could there. do the same with um, just regular sandpaper, though, right? Well, I you like to use a stainless steel well. blade, so it. Um, if you use that kind of blue metal uh, putty knife, you could probably do it. But I mean, I got to write on the grinder there anyway, and I go eh, mm-hmm. turn it on and just, you know, Eric power tool. There's always a good reason to use a power tool. <laughs> <laughs> I just look for reasons to pull out my tools. (laughs) Hey, would you like more of Garden Fork or more of Eric? Would you like to get it in your email inbox? I send out, just about every week, I send out a little email about Eric's world and new stuff I posted. I even talk about podcasts I've listened to or just interesting stuff. And usually, almost always, at least one picture 
of the Labradors, Henry and Charlie. You can get that by signing up for Eric's Garden Fork email newsletter thing. There should be a link in the notes to this show. Just scroll down to the description of the podcast in your app, and I hope it's a clickable link. It should be. Or go to gardenfork.tv, and on almost every page at the top of the page should be a sign-up. If you're on a mobile device, you might have to tap on the little... There's a little menu bar, and then hopefully there it'll be a sign-up. Or scroll the bottom of a post, and you can sign up there. Should be a link in the app here. More of Eric. It would be fun to have you along for the ride. It's kind of more brain dump Eric. Cool stuff. All right? The other thing we were talking about, I think getting the glue off is the hardest part because if you lay down, you know, if you if you use a primer, well, you're going to put a primer on anyway before you lay a top coat. Mm-hmm. But if you want to make it the wall look like it's been painted with a roller and it has kind of a stipple. I mean, after you've painted a wall with a roller a couple of times, that's kind of a stipple to it. Mm-hmm. You, you can hide some of those little highlights. But yeah, I mean, the skim coating is the way to go. And then I actually, instead of using sandpaper, if I have to sand any of the skim coat, I mm-hmm. use a, a, a damp sponge to cut the edges yes. off. Yes, definitely. And I think if I think if you've done a good job with your skin, and this is the same as with drywall too, when you're when you're drywalling and you've applied the mud properly, you uh, you definitely wouldn't need any more than just a, a sponge. Now, in the past, I've never been that great when I've done you know drywall. I've removed sections of walls and I've slapped that stuff on, yeah. <laughs> and then the whole room just looks like a cloud of dust because I have to sand it down. So you're you're right. The better the the job you do with the mud, the less you're going to have to sand, or if at all. You're yeah, I, I also like that. that you wear a mask while you're doing all that. Oh yes, yes. I I learned a long time ago. You you have to protect yourself, and I and even now there's times when, you know, I'm doing things in the garage, and I'm like, oh, I don't have a mask on. Sometimes it's easy to forget. Yes. But even just cutting wood, like, in fact, last week I was cutting these two by sixes. I'm, I'm making new stairs. I have this basement. I call it a Wizard of Oz door, but it's like a steelway <laughs> type door. But I call it Wizard of Oz. It just reminds me of that movie. And it's a walkout basement. And um, there's two by six stairs that kind of fit into these little grooves that are attached to the cement wall. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I'm out there, I'm cutting, I'm using this like amazing, uh, new, I'm in this program with Home Depot. And so they send me all these tools. I get to test them out. So this thing was just a heavy duty rear, you know, rear handle circular saw. And this thing's just, (laughs) and the dust is everywhere. And I'm thinking, this is not healthy breathing this stuff in. And, you know, I think if you've been in the industry for a long time, And you, you know, even if you have contractors come to your house, I mean, they're supposed to follow certain, you know, safety things. The OSHA Um, regulations, yeah. uh, yeah, Exactly. The OSHA regulations, but they don't. Um, Hearing protection, masks. I mean, even when we were in carpentry class with all of the drywall sanding that we were doing, you know, it wasn't, he wasn't adamant like, okay, you need to have your mask on. Everybody, make, you know, he was adamant about eye protection for sure. Right. But with the lungs, he was just like, you know, if you want a mask, here are some masks. But it wasn't like, okay, everybody needs to have this um, protection because it's dangerous for you. So I definitely, you know, on my channel, whenever I'm doing projects, I try to be the exemplary uh, of safety when I when I remember. Yeah. Um, but it, it's become even more ingrained in me to do this because what we do on online, people are following what we're doing. And I mean, I remember years ago when I would be stripping furniture and I would think it's really funny because I have, um, you know, stain all over my hands. Look at this picture guys, look at all this stain all over my hands. And I would take that and put it in a blog post. And now I'm thinking, what in the world were you thinking? Like you are staining without gloves. This is not funny. This is not healthy for you. So, you know, as I become, um, you know, as I get a little closer to being a licensed carpenter, the way I would like to be, and, you know, getting more experience in in the trades, I'm making safety more important. But, you know, there have been times, I I mean, good example, we had, I guess about a year ago, we had some 
uh, bricklayers come, some mason masons that came and fixed our uh, chimney. And it was so dusty. Yep. And I looked out there and nobody had masks on. None of them. They had Yeah, cement dust is very dangerous too. Yes. They had handkerchiefs on their face. And so I, you know, I just bought a, a new set of masks. So I went out there and I'm like passing them out to everybody like here, make sure you, and it was loud. There was, they didn't have any ear protection. And um, I think sometimes when you're, when you're in the trades and you do it all the time, it's easy to kind of get a little sloppy because you yeah. this time is money. You don't have time to stop and put on the mask and the hearing, hearing protection. But, you know, to me, it's important. Sometimes I do forget, but then I'm like, oh, wait a minute, hold on. Forgot that. Let me go do that. It's important. So we were, you mentioned that uh, wallpaper is on the rise. I actually have a mm -hmm. video about me hanging wallpaper. Oh, I have and to see it. Of course, something went wrong. <laughs> and I left it in on purpose, you know, because that's, it's the real world. It's the world of the imperfect how to, as I call it. But I want to talk a little bit more about that. Keep, keep that topic there, but go ahead and tell me we were going to tell me because I have something important to tell you about that. All right. Well, we were talking about wallpaper on the rise and in our brownstone down in New York and Brooklyn, we have some ax I, their accent wallpaper. It's wallpaper, but it's not wallpaper the whole room. Mm -hmm. It's just a part of a wall. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't remember the name of the cunt, but they're, it's from England and it costs a bajillion dollars. Oh, my goodness. But it's beautifully printed because I have some experience in printing, you know, analog mm -hmm. ink printing. But in Industry City, which is right near my house in Brooklyn, which is this um, set of old warehouses that are is filling up with internet startups and stuff and a food mm -hmm. court. And, but there is a custom designed wallpaper company there that has a storefront called Flavor Paper. Flavor Paper. And right there, it's like an open office. They're designing custom wallpapers for people. And then they have these giant printers right there that print out will print out a roll of wallpaper for you. Oh, that is so amazing. I have no idea how much it costs, but they're beautiful, really beautiful wallpapers. I'm going to have to look that up. You know, wallpaper, you know, even if you don't want to put wallpaper in your house, there's a lot of DIY projects that you can do with wallpaper. If you've got a bookcase, a bookshelf, and you want to line the back of it with wallpaper, um, you know, maybe you, maybe it's not for books, but maybe you've got some other things that you want to highlight in your room. Wallpaper can really set that off. And you could also do like the fronts of cabinets, or you can do, if you have a dresser, you know, maybe it's a plain Ikea dresser and you've always wanted to kind of jazz it up. You could do wallpaper on the front of that. And you could even do scrapbook paper too. I mean, if you don't want to pay the cost of wallpaper, because that, you know, as you mentioned, it's very expensive. Right. You can do scrapbook paper and line the front of your dresser drawers. You can also do the, do the inside of your drawers too, which is really fun because maybe, you know, maybe the outside is just a, a basic wood, but on the inside you did something fun. So every time you open it up, surprise, there's this beautiful, you know, paper inside. In fact, I did that on a project and it got a lot of mixed reviews because I didn't have one solid color of wallpaper. So I did sort of like this patchwork of oh, floral wallpaper, but it's so cute. And, you know, I know I'm, I'm looking at the vanity right now. Um, it's actually one of my, my highest viewed videos on my YouTube channel and you'll, you'll be able to see it there. Um, it's the one with the vanity and I think it's got maybe 2.1 million views, which is insane. Yeah. Um, but there were mixed reactions. Some people loved doing the light, the paper liners in the drawers. Some people thought, ah, oh, you just ruined it. But to me, whenever I open it up, I love seeing it. And, and honestly, to get that to stick, um, you know, if you're just using wallpaper or not wallpaper, scrapbook paper, you can do something called Mod Podge. It's really cheap. It's like $6 for a bottle. It's a glue, but it's also a sealer, right? Because yes. if you're lining your you can even line a desk the top of a desk if you're using this this uh wallpaper i'm probably even wallpaper but if you're using let's say scrapbook paper you you don't want to spill anything on it and then the paper's ruined so you can just do maybe one or two coats of of this mod podge it's a decoupage basically mm -hmm. but the brand name is called mod podge you can do one or two layers they've got a satin finish and then there's one that's glossy i tend to like the satin one better and, um, and it just seals it in. And so now you've got some drawers and, um, you know, dresser fronts that just look amazing with these pops of pops of color. I would have That's never thought fun. of that. 
Yeah. And also too, you can line, you can take fabric. I mean, gosh, my mind is going with all these different ideas. You can even take fabric. And I've done this where I've lined, I found these two, oh gosh, I don't even know what, I forget what style of, of end tables they were, but they were, they were actually bedside tables. And I painted them and took some really cool, like, uh, fabric that had French writing on them. And I mod podge them to the front of these, these bedside tables and it looks so good. I'll have to send you a picture of it. Yeah. If you want to link to it. Um, but yeah, but just using the mod podge sealed it in, made sure that it wasn't going to come up at the corners and, you know, protects that fabric so that it's like waterproof. So just lots of fun ideas. Who knew? Yeah. Well, we're almost out of time. Um, but we were going to talk about spray paint a little bit because I think people use spray paint badly and you seem to be <laughs> quite good at it. Yeah, I, you know, spray paint is the first thing that I had gravitated towards when I started uh, learning how to paint furniture, or I should say teaching myself how to paint furniture. Yeah. And, you know, you you can use spray paint to, to paint furniture, but I tend to, to tell people, you know, keep spray paint for the the like let's say the planters or you know if there's flower you know other flower pots or if you want to you know any small little thing that you want to paint I think spray paint is great furniture I think eh, stick with the furniture paints for the big pieces of furniture but in terms of like getting a good finish like you you have to look at the surface and say okay is this going to be a good surface to spray um they actually make primers that go in the spray paint. So if you go to like Home Depot, Lowe's, any of these stores, you will actually see spray paints that have primer in them. But you should probably, if you want this to last, if it's, if this is something that you're going to use, like for example, a couple of my videos, I did playhouse makeovers. You know, those little tykes, mm -hmm. plastic playhouses. They've done really well on my channel. And if you watch that video, you'll see some people comment, you didn't use a primer. It's going to scratch. <laughs> the thing is, I was just trying to get the project done. So, but if you are spray painting anything that, that has like plastic, definitely you can rough up the surface a little bit with maybe, let's say like a 100 and no, I would say like a very fine 220 grit sandpaper. You have to be careful because if you're, if you're doing something that's plastic, any of those scratches could come through the paint. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you don't want to rough it up, just make sure that you're using the primer regardless, because that'll help it to stick and then wait till that dries and then use your spray paint. But here's a little tip. So if you're using a dark spray paint, try to find a primer that's a dark, they have dark primer, like a dark gray, because what'll happen is if you use, let's say a white primer and a dark spray paint, now you've got the white coming through. And you're going to have to use more spray paint just to cover all that white. Exactly. So dark color, dark primer, light color, light primer. And then also, too, if you're spray painting metal, um, I had done some videos with Rust-Oleum over the summertime. And um, if you're painting metal, you definitely want to get their, the, the, the spray paint that's for metal because it'll help to prevent, prevent rust. And they actually have metal primers, too. So keep that in mind, make sure you're using the right spray paint. But then also too, you know, a lot of times if you're spray, spray painting something, your finger gets, I don't know if you've spray painted recently, but your finger gets so tired yep. as you're trying to spray this paint. And if you're getting tired and your fingers only pressing down a little bit, it's going to start sputtering. So I would recommend, I don't know if other brands make this. I know Rust-Oleum does. It's a little handheld trigger. That oh, just I've seen it, those. Yeah, it just basically just snaps onto the spray paint. So when you pull that trigger, the top, you know, the little thing will come down and spray the paint, spray paint for you. So it's like if using you to, a spray spray gun. Exactly, exactly. And, and I think that's good, too, for people, especially people that might have arthritis in their hands. It's hard for them to get that, that fine motion of just continuously pushing this little, you know, nozzle spray. Mm -hmm. So... Definitely, you know, use one of those little, um, I don't know the name of it, but you could probably link to it down below in your show notes. Um, that works really well when you're spray painting. And then in terms of distance, you, you want to keep it back probably about six to eight inches, but do a test first. Because what I found is that certain spray paints, I don't know why, 
some of them come out really fast and then some of them just seem like they're just very like a very light mist yep. so get a feel for the spray paint before you do it on your actual project and what i would recommend you know those lazy susans that you can put in the middle of your table oh yeah and when you're having like guests over and and you put the lazy susan there so you can turn the food I, i'm probably aging myself but <laughs> in your cabinet you probably have a lazy susan too right um if you have a way does. to easily turn your project What's that? Yeah, the thrift store does, right? Um, and you can even make a Lazy Susan, too. It's very simple. It's just a Lazy Susan. You can get two two wooden... Um, if you go to Home Depot, they've got these little... Oh, gosh. It's, it, if you look it up, it's called a Lazy Susan Hardware. And it's basically like ball bearings and two squares of metal. Yeah. And you would just take you know two pieces of wood and just put them together and put that little Lazy Susan in the middle. Because when you put your projects on there, and as you're spraying, you can easily move this thing from side to side so that you can keep going. Otherwise, you have to move yourself when you're spray painting. So That's that great. could be a fun project to do. Make a lazy Susan, and then you have something to set your projects on when you're spray painting. Um, and you want to keep it going, too. So you know, definitely don't get close, because then when you're too close, you get the runs. And if I get runs in my spray paint, I try to just take a little towel like a lint-free towel and just kind of dab them and if you dab them and then spray over it you should be able to cover it up but once it dries and you've got runs you're not really going to be able to sand that because it'll it'll turn very gummy so you want to catch those runs when you're when you're doing your spray painting don't wait till it dries and just keep it at a healthy distance wow that was pretty good for four yeah, minutes so that's, <laughs> oh my gosh wow i know i talk a lot too <laughs> No, I can it's get a lot out more than the average person. <laughs> That's, so I actually, it's kind of, I, my one thought is the uh, whole idea of buying a darker spray paint primer is totally like when you paint a room, I always yeah. take the top coat color and dump some into the primer. Mm -hmm. So I yep, tint the primer with the top coat. Very smart. Very smart. There was one other thing I wanted to say. I meant to I, I meant to tell you this as you were telling your story. Remember that comment you said a few minutes ago and you were talking about you you were you were putting up wallpaper and you made some mistakes? Yep. And I said, I, I wanna I wanna tell you something about that. I was gonna say that I love that's the kind of way that I I organize my videos. I love that when when we put ourselves out there and we make these mistakes because you know, we're, we're creating content for people to learn from, right? We're not, we're not just entertainers. We're not trying to just, you know, make your evening go faster and yes. just give you something to smile and keep going. We want to teach you something. And so I did a project yesterday. In fact, I don't know if you've seen it on my channel, but mm -hmm. it was a chair, like a rocking store chair that I got from the thrift store. And, um, I was going to refinish this, but I was going to use wood repair markers, no painting, no stripping, no restaining, anything like that. And the chair turned out beautiful, but I had a little mishap because in the packet of markers, there was a little alcohol, a little alcohol pad. And it says, if you put too much marker, you can, you know, wipe it off. Well, I did. I said, well, let me try this out so I can show people how it works. And I took the alcohol pad and I wiped like the entire side of the chair oh. and it started drying out and it looked horrible. And I, I left it in there, you know, and I told people, hey, when you're using this, make sure you only put this on that little area. Do not wipe your entire furniture. And the brand that I was working for um, to do this using their product, they were a little uh, they were a little worried that I'd put that in there. And I think I, the reason I'm bringing this up is because, you know, if a lot of times brands don't realize that what makes look like a negative thing is actually a positive thing. Like people want to, to see us make mistakes because it shows them what could happen yep. and what not to do. And so I just wanted to tell you that little story because it was, it was kind of funny when I found out that they were worried that I'd put that information in there. And I'm like, they don't realize that's a good thing. Like we have to show mistakes because it makes us human. And then it shows people how to use this product without you know, destroying their pro their project. It wasn't destroyed. The, the chair actually turned out. It's beautiful. looks really good. Oh, cool. But 
yeah, I just wanted to share with you, keep putting the mistakes in there because people love to see us mess up so that they don't mess up. <laughs> I saw the thumbnail of that video on your, on your channel. I just haven't mm -hmm. watched it yet. Um, I kind of, I find myself going down a rabbit hole with YouTube on my iPad and then I'm like, I got to go back to work, you know? Yes. <laughs> yes. I do that too. <laughs> All right. So we can find you on Instagram and YouTube. Is there any other, any other social places that you like to go? Well, I'm pretty active on both of those. YouTube is kind of really become my number one, but you can find me at thriftdiving.com. I'm putting out blog posts and I respond. I try to respond to every comment if I can. Um, but yeah, like thrift diving is just a community and come check me out. That's cool. Well, thanks again for being on the show. And thank, um, you. thank you for answering all my knucklehead questions <laughs> when I email you questions about things. <laughs> hey, no problem. I enjoy it. Garden Fork Radio's executive producer is Jimmy Goots. You can find more information about Jimmy and the custom hollow books he makes at hollowbooks.com. Our theme music is used under license from uniquetracks.com. Other music used in the show is used under license from audioblocks.com. <laughs>